say that as a yes. Okay, um, so welcome everybody to uh, uh, to, uh, around the climate jobs booklet that the campaign against climate change has produced. Um, we've had a series of, of meetings of which this is the fifth in which we're dealing with individual chapters in, in the booklet, which allows us to go into a little bit more detail than the book as a whole. And uh, I have to say so far, we found that that's really prompted some, some interesting, uh, well, both presentations and discussions. So let's hope we can continue that trend tonight. I'm sure we can with our three guest speakers and uh, some Q and A and contributions after that. And we're hoping to finish the meeting at nine. Um, a couple of things, just watch out for your name on the screen because it may come up with words info test, uh, in which case, uh, please feel free to substitute your own name in for that, unless your name is info test, of course. Um, secondly, uh, just to say that uh, the, I think there's the little broadcast uh, signal somewhere which is not actually broadcasting to anything other than the app that produces the captions at the foot of the screen. Uh, and thirdly, um, just to say that we are recording this initial part of the uh, of the meeting, the part where the speakers are going to give their contributions. Uh, I don't think we're going to uh, record the discussion afterwards. It, it's, it's just that part that we're going to put up on the website for, for people to look at, I think. So um, with that, can I just say that, um, well, firstly, very good to see such good attendance. We're up to almost 30 at the moment. So... That, that is great. Um, this, this particular session will, is called uh, Towards Zero Waste, jobs, Climate Jobs in the Circular Economy. And as you, you know, it's to do with an area which has kind of underpinned um, many of the other chapters in the booklet when we've had that basically talked about things like um, uh, reducing, reusing, you know, the reduction in consumption, reusing materials and, and and not wasting essentially, making use of what we have. And here we're focusing explicitly on that subject uh, in terms of what we actually do. Um, I'll introduce the three speakers individually. Um, I can't let it pass really without just saying, I don't want to be too, um, too kind of aggressive about it, but you know, we, we're at a moment right now, what with uh, the price of fuel, um, the things that are going on in the world where there's there's a there's there's just a, an opportunity begging really to go towards uh, the kind of climate agenda that we um that we've been advocating and which is expressed in this booklet and we you know it's, it's a measure of just how well completely useless really the, the current government is that it's not actually picking up on this and actually doing something with it because now is the moment when we should be grasping these issues and actually uh producing the policies and then enacting them in order to, to get on with the kind of things that we've been talking about this series of meetings. Um, that's where we are and it's, it's by any sane measure the kind of things you're going to hear about tonight are the things that we should be doing. So uh, I, won't, I won't bang on about that. Let's, let's introduce our guest speakers. Uh, the first is a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Fliss Premru. She is a member of the Campaign Against Climate Change and she's one of the co-authors of the booklet and specifically the lead author of the chapter that we're talking about tonight on waste and the circular economy. So Fliss, would you like to go ahead? Thanks very much. And thanks to everybody for coming and apologies if you signed up for last week and unfortunately we had to move that to this week and I'm glad that you could you could join us. Um, yes, I've been a member of the campaigning against climate change um, trading group for, for some years. And we came together really essentially to debunk this notion that you can have a good job or a good environment. We know they absolutely go together. We know that it's key to trade union work to, um, to do not only um, climate work, but climate justice work, and it intersects with every area of our life. Um, and more than ever, we need to really look at the jobs that we need uh, for the future, for the 21st century. Um, we need to look at it in terms of a plan. We need to look at it in terms of um, gender and race equality and not simply transferring the jobs from um, from the 19th and 20th century um, into some a sort of electrified job for, jobs for the future. Um, I am also a, um, I'm also um, a co-chair um, of the um, Leicester TUC 
environmental and just transition network and we we um leslie is now a member of um, the campaign against climate change and we try to work quite closely together um in terms of waste um yes i contributed to what's a, a very short chapter for a very big subject and it does totally intersect with all the other um and chapters as well it's you can you can't look at any of them in, in isolation um i am absolutely no expert and i'll speak for a very short time so that we can hear from rembrandt and jonathan um but obviously like all of us i i'm a maker of waste and i'm very interested in how we can start to move to something sustainable at the moment we're in this situation where we're very much in the linear economy we uh, take resources we make we transport we use we make obsolescence a lot of the time and then we buy some more so it's a total consumer society and we are really locked into that um so we have we know we have a long way to go to look at a circular economy and there are very few societies that really use and and uh, we've got to look at it as, uh, as waste not as waste but as a resource I think the amount of things that are used to the end of their life how they could really be used since we use such a lot of water and minerals and all sorts of things that are that are, are, are not renewable um is something like two percent um, it's very, very small that it's actually properly be used. And what we need, need to move into is a circular economy where we really look at things like um, repair, reuse, um, how we, we value our resources um, even before we go to recycle. And we know that we can do a lot more with, re with recycling too. And it's quite a Western thing as a Western capitalist because obviously in some societies, um, waste and Result. And when you're in a poorer society, especially kind of in developing societies, those on the margins often um, make even their living just by picking around waste and actually reusing in, in, in different ways. And it's quite interesting when you look at some of the studies that have, that have been done to show that jobs have come out of that too. Um, and we have we we um, actually Claire, could I have the um, slide as well as this little slide that we've done for this, um, uh, we've got a, a, a series on transport and so on. And I think somebody asked, if, and that is that um, uh, we will just set, set it out as a link, as we have done for all the all the other um, film uh, films on on transport meetings and transport and so on. Um, yeah, so um, just to, to prompt my memory as well, in 26, 24.6 million tonnes of waste um, in, in 2019, half of which sent to landfill, greenhouse gases, and obviously a lot of that is also food waste. And we need to tackle our food waste. There's lots of methane that comes out. And the whole thing around waste is that it's very much a climate justice issue too. Um, it's a whole story of outsourcing uh, and offshoring. Um, and when we talk about climate jobs, we're really talking about the jobs that we need for the future, but we're talking about jobs that we see under the umbrella of a national climate service um, with a plan for each of the services and how they intersect so that you have good trade unionized jobs, um, safe jobs, and you really need safe jobs in, in waste and circular economy. It's a very risky business and it is under underrepresented in the trade union movement. And um, the, there are actually apparently, for example, more accidents in um, offshore wind than there are, are, are in offshore wet, uh, offshore oil at the moment. So we need to really make sure that we are unionizing. And in terms of the circular economy, um, we need to look at what we can do nationally, but also locally. I think there's so much scope locally. Um, you know, there's a there's a very different level of um, of recycling um, and reuse um, depending on where you are, even in the UK. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that from our speakers. Um, but very much um, we can look at the sorts of jobs that we we could create in that and hopefully the sorts of jobs that we could create locally in a circular economy. Uh, the scope for repair, the scope for repair, for example, in electrics, um, we know we've also got laws that we need to fight against built-in obsolescence and, you know, the whole thing with, say, mobile phones and having to have the newest technology all the time and the huge drain on resources and batteries and the toxicity. Um, but if we started to tackle both the laws and also our ability 
to rebuild things, you've got quite a lot of scope, I think, in, in a vast array for, for, for jobs um, and reducing. And also we have to look at single use plastic. Um, there are laws coming in around that. Um, and in some places, for example, in Scotland, they already are starting, um, they've already legislated for having um, drinks deposit um, schemes. So drinks container deposit schemes. And those of you like myself who are older might remember that, um, you know, we used to take bottles back when we were young and you'd get the money back. And um, there's no reason why we shouldn't be pushing for this in a huge range of places from everything from deliveries to put the onus back also on the producer. So there is producer responsibility because a lot of the time there is not, they do not have to take it back. They do not have to reuse. And we need to really turn that back so there is also producer responsibility. Um, and um, there's a huge scope for, for things like rent um, as well. Um, back in the day, people used to uh, rent things like, like TVs. Um, further back than that, um, for example, when there were early, when, when pneumatic tyres were quite a new thing, for example, with the buses in London, the buses used to actually rent the tyres for the company. So they'd maintain them and rent them. And OK, that's not the highest technology now, but it was quite a new thing at the time, maybe in the 1920s. But there's also things like um, Rolls Royce um, aircraft engines, for example, that they um, will maintain and um, rent them according to, to use. So that it's not um, as people with particular um, expertise with, with parts. Um, so we need to really turn this down, turn this round, and think. Well, what what sort of what sort of jobs could we have? What what could we create, and um, how can we go about that? That's that's a big question. I hope we'll come to that far more in our conversation later on. Um, but definitely looking at some models. There's quite an interesting um, circular waste, a very interesting circular waste economy. Uh, example in, in Ljubljana in, in uh, Slovenia and Ljubljana Slovenia has actually got a, a pretty right-wing government now um, but the local um, the the local uh, waste is actually very much a public sector um, economy and they have really tried to make this as, um, as circular as possible and looking at all those different component parts and um, deposits um, and, and uh, reverse spending and lots of different things. That's really interesting. I also think looking at, at Argentina and Buenos Aires, um, some of the workers who used to literally pick cardboard and pick waste because of poverty have now been brought into um, the, um, the local economy to work with businesses, to work with um, domestic um, to, uh, just just households and so on, everybody to see how they can do more recycling. They're called the cartoneras, uh, the cardboard recyclers, and actually they're, they're now paid properly for, for the jobs that they do. So there's a vast array of things that, that we, can, we can look at. Um, I'm going to stop there and look forward to our discussion. We, we can bring some more items back in the discussion. I'm going to hand over to to hear. Thanks a lot. Okay, very good, Fliss. Um, thank you. Um, okay, well, let, let's press on then. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Rembrandt Coppola, who is a uh, who's the head of circular economy at EcoWise Limited, which is, I believe, an organisation um, that uh, provides kind of solutions for a circular economy. Uh, he has a PhD from. Imperial Policy and published articles on uh, the future of energy and also uh, the role of technology as well in achieving a circular economy. So uh, Rembrandt, please go ahead. Uh, thank you kindly to hear. I'm much appreciated to, to be here this evening. And next, I hope. Um, there are three, three aspects that uh, I would like to address. And the first one, it's kind of obvious since you're all here, but a circular economy is really a jobs economy. Um, and the way that we can think, think about active of waste is if you look at what ha currently happens with our waste is that about uh, if you, the traditional way of disposing it, so landfill or uh, energy from waste incineration, if you start recycling that waste, you provide a up to a factor 10 more jobs. Um, so you go from one job to 10 jobs. You have the same type of waste, but you don't burn it or landfill it, you recycle it. If you start then to 
focus on really repair and reuse, uh, that's really a factor of 100 more jobs. So you can get that order of magnitude of jobs if you are able to, um, instead of shredding your furniture, shredding your washing machines. This is literally what happens in many cases, uh, also in, in recycling. Um, so you start to reuse, you extend the lifespan, um, and there's repair involved. There is a lot of logistics involved. There's warehouse management involved. There are jobs involved in quality conditions testing. Um, and if you put all of that together, uh, you can say that a future where we have, we maximize reuse, we can get up to maybe one in 30 jobs, especially if you also include construction and demolition, would be related to reuse in a broad sense, which also includes manufacturing of spare parts and replacement parts, uh, uh, upcycling or local creative jobs to make uh, old items into new ones that are looking even better or are even nicer to, to have in your home, uh, unique items, uh, all kinds of jobs uh, that are possible around this. So that's the, the good news. In, in a way, uh, for locally, if we're talking about uh, jobs and, and meaningful jobs, many of them. Um, the challenge is that why does this not happen? And this is, in my view, is related to that waste. The issue of waste is really linked to as many issues to a lot of social injustices that are currently existing in society. Um, and there are three I want to highlight. Um, and that is, uh, one is really the core area of this is around wealth distribution. Uh, a lot of the efforts that you need to do to create a, um, say, to refurbish or upholster a chair, that currently happens, but it happens with old, uh, fairly old antique chairs, and they're expensive once they're upholstered. There's a market for that in England. Uh, this happens uh, with, uh, in a, on a very small scale with uh, some electronic items, this happens at the at the larger scale for clothing, but people don't purchase necessarily those clothes uh, at a large scale. Most of the clothes that are going for reuse are exported from England. So there, and a large part of this is related to not having enough uh, wealth for people. I think, in my view, uh, to be able to purchase and also to be able to kickstart that system. So if you are going to be able to buy a, a new set of clothes that is much more affordable, you're not more likely going to go for uh, goods that are five times the cost uh, that may be, have been repaired, reused, and so on. I'm, of course, simplifying here. A second part, and this is where is a big social injustice, is that there's a lot of furniture poverty. We're talking about the cost of living crisis. Before the cost of living crisis, uh, there's a, a campaign and an associated charity. They're doing a lot of uh, good work. It's called End Furniture Poverty. Couldn't be more, more clear than that. And what they're advocating for is to have uh, be able for all people in the UK to access the furniture they need. And what they mean with furniture poverty in a definition is that you're unable to access or afford to buy, maintain a household furniture appliance that is essential to achieve a socially acceptable standard of living. So you don't have a washing machine. So you have to go to the launderette. Um, you don't have uh, access to the couch that you need, um, or your your appliance breaks and you don't have the money to buy a new one. And they estimated about 5 million people in the country miss at least one appliance. Um, and so this is a big issue uh, that can be resolved partially uh, by the circular economy, hopefully, with uh, in terms of making it possible to have more access to uh, appliances and to furniture. Another social injustice that relates to this is that at the moment, and this relates also to wealth distribution, we destroy annually millions of goods that are unsold. Yeah? Uh, it's not just Amazon, this is standard practice. So we have people who don't have access, and because of the way that wealth is distributed, uh, we uh, and the government doesn't have laws that prevent this at the moment. There's a lot of goods that are uh, destroyed. So this is also intrinsically linked with, in that sense, with social injustices. That on the one hand, people need things, and the other hand, we destroy them. 
Um, and then also at the, the global level, of course, with uh, extractivism and uh, uh, imports um, dumping, this is a broader uh, topic that maybe in the discussion we can hopefully touch upon, but uh, global supply chain networks. Now, the third point I want to make is that the key enablers for repair and reuse jobs are both local and national government. Yeah. Um, local government because they have the power to collect. Yeah, it's their responsibility. They have to. But also what less people know is they have the power to provide access. So if you provide something uh, to the local government that goes to a, a reuse and recycling center or skip or uh, in uh, where the collection banks are, uh, so the collection points are decided, but also whether the charity can have access to furniture that's donated to them or can have access to electronics. And often in that network, there's limited attention for reuse and repair. It's, it's growing, but it's not high on the priority of the agenda because there are no targets. There are no targets. We reuse two to three percent of, of what's uh, collected. Um, and uh, so uh, there's a lot of potential items that instead of shredding them, we could look at repairing and reuse them. Um, and um, there's a lot of possibilities. A great example, at the moment, for the, in, in North London, we are starting to recycle mattresses since last year, which is a great development. But we're not reusing mattresses. And there is a charity linked to the end furniture poverty that in Liverpool started to do they inspect the mattresses they have a line that makes it bacteria free stain free uh, and almost as good as new or as good as new in certain cases because some mattresses are not worn um, and so there are investments possible that can create a pool um, to work together with this charity that's developed this machine it's operational in liverpool people can visit um, it could be brought anywhere in the country so this is the power of local government um, where they have, because they are the owner of the, the bulky waste and anything that's collected also in clothing, and the local government decides how many clothing banks there are. Um, so this is why some of the councils in London have five clothing banks and others have 70. Yeah. That's their decision to whether they allow charities to, to have clothing banks in public spaces and where. Of course, there's planning regulations, and, and so you can't just place them everywhere, and it's a bit more complicated. But in general, there shouldn't be a difference between one council and the other in London in terms of infrastructure access, uh, at least from an outsider perspective. The second part is really the, the national government and the national legislation. And this relates to the also a lot more to the social injustices. We talked about uh, the uh, destruction of unsold goods but also minimum wage uh, availability, the, the amount of uh, income that people have to be able to purchase goods that are more locally made uh, uh, in terms of repair, reuse, and so on. And also uh, legislation that helps with making it easier for companies to have either a level playing field so that they have to provide, say, a repair index uh, have to provide repair information and that all companies have to do that. Um, so there are initiatives to repair labels um, that show when you buy something, how easy it is to repair it. And most people will then want to probably buy something that's more easy to repair. Not everyone, but, and that will drive these kind of jobs as well. So there's a lot of requirements that need to be put in place uh, that we don't have both locally and that can be actioned and nationally. That's the third point is the, is the key driving force uh, in the near term future to make these jobs possible. Um, that's my time. So thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Rembrandt. That's really interesting. And, and within time as well, you saved me the effort there. Um, but I'm sure we'll be coming back to this because that was a, such, a, such an interesting uh, contribution. I think it's a measure of how interesting a contribution is if people start tapping in, in the chat boxes because it, you've got them thinking about stuff. So hopefully we'll hear from them when we come to the, the discussion. Uh, okay, so the, our final speaker tonight then is, is Jonathan Essex. So I'm very glad to be able to introduce uh, Jonathan. I worked with Jonathan on production of the uh, booklet about the Green New Deal for Gatwick, which uh, we were very pleased with. Um, Jonathan is a member of the Greenhouse Think Tank. He's also a 
Green Party councillor uh, in Crawley, I think, uh, or around the, the Gatwick area. Uh, and he's also a trustee of furniture, a local furniture reuse company. So picking up on exactly the points that, uh, that Rembrandt has just made. Uh, so Jonathan, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, no problem. Just one question. Am I allowed to share my screen? Have I got permission to share a screen? I'll make you that post and then um, that should be fine, I think. Have a go. Can you see that? Does that work? Perfect. That's great, John. Okay. I'm just going to whiz through these slides fairly quickly. Hopefully, this will prompt some questions at the end. Um, here it goes. So, uh, my my pitch for for this is is starting with climate change, and and I'm going to spend a little bit of time just discussing the problem before looking at climate jobs as a solution. So clearly, currently we are we have a circular economy, but it's worse than that. It's a spiral economy. We are literally spiraling out of control. And this linear economy is destructive. This is from a recent report by Greenhouse. Look at the impact of mineral extraction, which is the antithesis of a circular economy, um, which is causing um, real livelihood issues around the world, not just climate issues. Um, the scale of our resource use is massively increasing. Um, look at the numbers in the, in the column of how much resources we're using and how that compares, just say, back to 1970 globally. That's where we're going now. That's what the challenge is. And in the UK, you know, these are massively big numbers. And the challenge we have is the stuff we're using now, which is not circular, not climate jobs. Um, you know, the ones I've highlighted there are, are we're making things that you cannot make in a zero carbon way. And we're using lots of it. So the climate jobs aspect is not just dealing with the waste which we've got or making a, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step change on or incremental change of what we are now we need to transform our relationship with stuff and the sort of materials we use and how much we use of them um, uh, this is a, a very simple graph um, basically what we do is is we start by using sustainable materials and we get to a point where um, we start thinking well there's not enough renewable energy around at some point in the past we, passed, we stopped using wind uh, and and uh, timber in a sustainable manner and started getting stuff out of the ground uh, and that's the real challenge. And then we start to increase how much unsustainable stuff we use to the point where we are literally outside of what's socially and environmentally success acceptable. We would need to reduce our propensity to take stuff out of the ground, whether that's oil, gas, or you know, also the all the other stuff we take out of the ground in an unsustainable manner, so we can get back into a sustainable space. So that's going to be uh, increasing the jobs intensity, as Rembrandt has said, uh, but, but reducing the carbon intensity and, and the total scale of material use that our society relies on. Uh, materials uh, sit in the, the hard to decarbonize sector. This is from, a, a, you know, there's, there's big challenges here because we um, continue to use this stuff and, and, and it's difficult. Um, we can't just look at uh, reuse and recycling as the reuse and recycling of business as usual. We need to transform our whole economy and see more than just what we do um, with the waste that comes out the end. So, so our challenge is, is that as well as thinking about um, waste, we need to look at sustainable choices of what we use in the first place. Um, and, and that's about, you know, the stuff coming back into play rather than us needing so much need to reduce the scale of what we use um, so that's that's just a simple diagram saying that we use more and more each year um, that's the economics version and that's the climate version um, currently we use more and more energy to have more and more stuff so we build more and more stuff which is more and more um, consumables of every kind so we are live in a globalized world we ship stuff around the world in massive quantities we fly stuff around the world in massive quantities and if you just look at t-shirts and fashion, 6.6% um, of our fashion is flown around the world. That has massive carbon impact. And this is a linear process in the news recently, how this fast fashion is ending up being dumped in, in Africa and so forth. So creating climate jobs, relocalizing our economy back to the UK is challenging some of these assumptions. It, it's moving away from a business as usual, globalizing economy and, and consciously 
in a planned way, relocalizing economies, creating jobs in the process. Um, we need to talk about scale. I like this cartoon. Um, I think it sums up where we need to go. Um, so we're talking about snail jobs here. Uh, and snails um, are, are smaller than elephants and move in different ways. So you, you might think about scale and, and, and the idea of local jobs starting with small is beautiful. Uh, but I think it's realized in action by an excellent book, um, coincidentally also talking about a million uh, jobs uh, by Colin Crooks. He says there's a thousand areas in the UK that have intergenerational unemployment. And if you created a thousand jobs in each of those thousand places in social enterprises, publicly linked, changing the procurement dynamics, maybe along the, site, along the lines of something called the Preston model, which might come up in discussion later, we can really transform local economies and use climate jobs as a way of creating sustainable local economies. And, and I think using climate jobs as a way of creating new economic models is what we need to do. And materials and reuse and recycling sit at the heart of that. Um, as, as Dahir mentioned, I've been doing a little bit of work with him and others looking at what those local job plans might be, uh, initially around airports in the last couple of years, because that's where jobs have been lost. Um, but more recently in Cumbria, and, and that's that's looking at how you know we have material jobs um, proposed in a coal mine, uh, and instead um, reuse and recycling and circular economy jobs are part of a different economic model that can replace it. Um, in terms of the reuse and recycling repair, I'm just going to whisk through these quite quickly. Uh, we looked at the household recycling rate. Now we said, what if that was best practice in Europe? Um, that would gain a thousand jobs. On top of that, you could create jobs, creating a more circular economy, which might be directly involving materials, but might be moving away from that. So it could be things like setting up, um, for example, more laundry services locally. Um, so the, the jobs are then in more in the service sector than in, in the material extraction or processing. Um, th this is a key source of information. Um, there's the same sorts of statistics keep pop popping up again. I think it dates from initial research done in the US. This is the Friends of the Earth looking at the real numbers of jobs you create um, uh, by shifting to a circular economy. Um, and it's happening already. What this, what this graph shows is um, as you reduce the grey, which is the amount of waste you throw away, you can increase the recycling. And that process of, of cutting the landfill in the incineration and increasing what's reused and recycling creates jobs, creates value, and reduces the overall wastefulness of our society. So in Cumbria, um, we use the Friends um, As Rembrandt said, the, the numbers talk about a, a, a tenfold shift um, for recycling over landfill and incineration. Uh, we, we base the, our job estimates on the additional jobs in collecting the waste and sorting the waste for recycling. Uh, we assumed half the job intensity for commercial, industrial and construction compared to household waste. We took off the amount of jobs lost on landfill sites and we, we have a thousand new jobs. And then in addition, we explored the possibility of creating jobs for a circular economy. I'll just touch on these briefly before the end. Four different areas. Firstly, um, reuse, repair, there's lots of really good examples of local reuse and high quality recycling across the country, but most of them sit in the voluntary sector and most communities have one or two of these, but not all of them. If you had these clustered together, uh, if you had them everywhere, if you had them led by the public sector rather than, you know, almost being survived independently of any government action, local or national, you could really transform our society uh, and really make sure the maximum amount of stuff that could be reused and recycled back into being is done so. Secondly, we looked beyond the household, we looked at um, steel, we looked at the construction side. This was linked to the coal mine story. Um, the idea of the linear economy in the UK is we, we import iron ore, we import coal, we produce steel of a low quality that we don't need, we export it, and we export most of our scrap. If we reused all the scrap we have, we make in the UK, um, in the UK, then you know the, the carbon intensity of steel production would be reduced to a third, and it has the potential then to go right down as we decarbonize electricity. Um, in Cumbria, um, we found that Workington, just for example, is a place that used to have jobs 
um, making steel um, and, and is also a place where there's lots of offshore wind farms planned which are, need a lot of steel so we could collect the steel there we could make this make the steel using renewable energy generation offshore and then use that to make new steel which can again be used to make more offshore electricity generation so it could be a win-win situation and 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 how does that make sense that makes sense by reducing the amount of steel demand in things like construction by are we using these scarce uh, material resources for for creating the zero carbon economy we need to have ahead of us um, so this is what happens to steel at the moment in the uk flows in what we're proposing is that more of the steel in the UK should stay in the UK and that would increase the jobs in steel and it would reduce the amount of huge carbon footprint that that single sector has. A third example is you buy office grade recycled paper to use in your printer it will be made probably from nuclear power in France we don't make any office grade recycled paper in the UK but if we did so, we would reduce the amount of paper we import. It would higher quality separation of paper for recycling. And, and, and there, are, there is local expertise in, expertise in paper making that can un underpin that kind of job creation. And the final example was, was just to pick a few numbers from the government. The government, for example, says that in 2022, um, I think that's fairly soon then, um, that all plastic packaging should include 30% recycle, recycle plastic. Estimates suggest that this would um, require double UK plastics reprocessing. So we need to do that. But where's the effort to create those extra local jobs, those jobs to uh, separate uh, and reprocess plastics? It's all talk at the moment at government. All these strategies are coming through, but we need to make sure they they create jobs, they have the skills support, and it actually happens in reality. That's what needs to happen. Uh, and that's the end of the presentation. Look forward to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jonathan. That was great. Okay, um, so we've, we've heard, um, hopefully you've absorbed quite a lot of information there and the chat is very active, um, and lots of useful links. Thank you, Debbie, in particular, you posted a few, number of useful links there. Um, Jonathan, I think um, for me, the th oh, thank you. Um, for me, on your, when you show, isn't it, to think that um, the huge increase in, in resource use that you, that you showed, I mean, that's, that's kind of escalated in the period since we've been conscious about the, the impact that we're having on the planet. I mean, that really shows you the, the size of the, the, the issue that we're dealing with. Um, it's just something that really struck me about, about, uh, about your presentation. But Jonathan, do you want to go first and, and kind of sum up um, your thoughts on these issues? Hey, I, I can do, I, I guess it's just to respond to some of the questions that's been asked. I've been scribbling down notes and thoughts. Um, your, your general point, point there to here, I, I would summarise as it's easy to think of climate change as a challenge of energy, but roughly half the energy, or sorry, roughly half the climate emissions in the world are climate emissions that come about by creating what we build with and what we buy. So we can't deal with climate change looking only at the energy used in cars, in buildings and in electricity. We need to look at the energy and the carbon emissions going into what we make. Um, just picking up a couple of comments on the chat. Demolition, I think, you know, we need to value embodied carbon um, in, in what we make, the, and also the embodied workmanship, the, in, the, the jobs that are captured in, you know, in, in what we make. Um, uh, steel and concrete, um, question in the chat, can we make the same things from electric arcs as we can from blast furnaces? Well, yes, but. We need to make sure steel isn't contaminated, particularly with copper. So that means we need to separate scrap. So you can't just crush a car and stick it in an electric arc furnace. You need to take the motor with its copper windings out separately so you don't up the copper level in the, in the steel. Um, but why are we using so much steel and concrete in the first place? Well, we're a developed country. Well, we shouldn't need quite so much building material, should we? We, we really need to shift to the, the, the reuse, the circular economy, in the big things like buildings as well as in what we put out on our household rubbish and and that means that you know i th think that 
someone talks about tax and 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 is it too much about tax well i say we're ta currently taxing the wrong things in the uk currently have zero vat on new build housing but full vat on refurbishment sweden is one country that's cut vat on repairs if we're going to deal with climate change we need a carbon tax and if you apply that to making stuff that will mean carbon import duties on products which have high carbon intensities from overseas so you know what to what to mainstream change well i think we need culture change we need compliance but ultimately we need government to create a new framework for action local councils have a key role to play but local councils ability to finance things has been cut substantially by money taken away from them by central government since 2010 um, and I'm just going to end, if I may, just responding to points made by Wolfgang in particular, challenging us as to whether this means ending capitalism and Jennifer saying, how does this work economically? And beyond the, the, the taxing the right things, not the wrong things, I, I would say that we need to shift from a capitalism um, that is globalizing to smaller local economies with shorter supply chains. So our use of resources is a local circular economy not a global circular economy. It must be an end to growth in the scale of material and energy use. And a spoiler alert, a lot of the talk of circular economy is linked to an idea called green growth, which is the idea that we can carry on uh, making our economy bigger and bigger. Uh, and quite often people talk about the circular economy at the same time, talk about taking more oil and gas out the ground, opening up more quarries, um, both in the UK and for scarce materials around the world. The wage share of the economy is still falling in the UK. More of our economy is in um, uh, shares and in ownership. Um, the reason why buildings are demolished is often pure speculation. It's a housing market. We need to make sure the circular economy makes a sensible amount of money for everyone and, and concentrate that wealth in the income that people take, take home with them, which is about jobs. And if you want a, a quick thought of, of, of where economy and, and capitalism links to this at the end, I would say, um, think about Tim Jackson, what he's written. 10 years or so ago, he wrote Prosperity Without Growth. But last year, his book was called Post Growth, but it was subtitled Life After Capitalism. We need to think about the material world and we need to put sufficiency first. We need to do reduce before we do reuse. And think of reuse as sharing and think about this as a sharing economy to get us to a different place in the future. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Fantastic. Uh, Rembrandt, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, I'm very happy to go next. I think part of uh, my overarching comment, the red thread, is that I think we need to think a bit bigger. Um, I'll first start with the uh, maybe the biggest part here is the, the idea of ending capitalism. And then I, I fully agree that we should talk more about this. And I think we should be very pragmatic and specific. And for example, talking about uh, shifting from capital ownership to communal capital ownership. I'll give one very specific example. Camden is sort of uh, asking its residents to give some money for green investments. But they're not giving their residents for that investment the opportunity to get ownership. You, know, you get a bit of return maybe from the council, but they're not looking at these kind of models. So, uh, and this is also with uh, buildings, uh, with uh, uh, developments and so on. I think a second part that's more related to this, uh, to the discussion today more on circular economy is we're talking about taxation, but really the, the, the biggest part is here, we should shift from taxing labor, yeah, taxing, taxing people to taxing resource extraction, taxing consumption, especially with different, Different levels massively extended to all kinds of goods and ending labor taxation and that can also relate to all the system there are lots of calculations that have been done around this and there's a lot more tension that could go to it and it's a big uh, political struggle um in the question of uh, local initiatives i think the key challenge is again also uh, we need bigger ideas if we're talking about library of things, we should not be, should be talking about library of things, we should be talking about how can we provide reuse, all of that works, um, and, and have a, a, a library of things locker in all the estates in France. If we're talking about a repair cafe, we should not be talking about repair cafes, we should be talking about repair and reuse malls. 
Yeah, there is a mall. Sweden has one. At Hansen, there's not a center. It's a mall. People go there to do shopping. Yeah, and you only buy reused and repaired goods. And it's uh, and so we need to think bigger because that creates uh, centers which can then bring in repairs, bring in companies, bring in charities, bring in people. And it shouldn't be somewhere in a, in a, in an industrial zone. No, it needs to be on the high street because that's when people will come. Uh, they, they're not. They, it's not a fun trip to go to a reuse and recycling center, as they're called. Uh, it's uh, it's like a chore, so you don't want to do that. So this is the kind of uh, I think think we we really need to start thinking bigger and then discussing those ideas more, uh, and uh, trying to see okay how can we get that flowing? A reuse and recycling mall cost eighty million pounds. Okay, how would that work? How do we get eighty million pounds? Uh, that's the the, Sweden, the cost in Sweden. It's it's uh, cost neutral after a few years in their model. Um, I think there are some uh, talks about behavior, and I think that's the last last uh, uh, point. I think Debbie mentioned that uh, the highest emitters are the top ten percent, and how and uh, these people consume a lot. Um, we did. Uh, together with Essex County Council, the company I work for, we did a survey specifically in clothing. Uh, including uh, secondhand shopping versus buying new clothes. And we actually found that people who earn more than £90,000 a year in income, uh, there's no difference depending on the generation. So women in their 20s and 30s, regardless of income, are much more in the reuse economy of clothing um, than other generations. And the worst, it's very simple, are men. Men are not in the reuse economy of clothing. They don't go and buy secondhand clothes. They don't sell them online, their clothes and buy them. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, learnings in terms of, we, we haven't even done the low hanging fruit of men uh, in many cases, uh, university society. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's key there. And there are people with high incomes that actually have sustainable clothing lifestyles. So there is, the answer is more complicated. Uh, and how do we tap into that? Well, that's, I'm not a marketing expert. So, but um, I hope one or two of you are and, uh, and can give some answers. Uh, I, yeah, I, there's a lot to say about the building and demolishing of council estates and, and but that's a, that's a whole big topic as well. Um, so uh, thank you. Great stuff, Rembrandt. Thank you, and uh, really appreciate yours and Jonathan's contribution. I have one, sorry, to, here, I, I will, it, if I may, yes. one no, thing about okay. buildings, and this relates to uh, Tony's point about mobile phones that should be like Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. The same should be with buildings. The cost of the replacement of the cladding since Grenfell is enormous. Why is that? Because it's very complicated to replace cladding on buildings in the way that they've been built, and because they've not been built in a modular way. That's the only point I. Sorry if I have to interrupt, but I think these kind of things, we don't make these connections. But this is, uh, billions could have been saved if the cladding was easily taken out and replaceable. That's it. No, that's a great point. Yep. No, great, great stuff, yeah. Um, Fliss, I'm gonna call you, call you. I, I think I'll, if, if you can finish off the meeting, I think I'll just say, um, Thank you to everybody for participating. Thank you to the speakers for some excellent contributions. And what we've done here is really build the links over these last five meetings across the whole of the climate jobs um, uh, landscape, really. And, and this, is, this is kind of the, the, the final piece of that puzzle, in a sense. And if you haven't already got the climate jobs book, I'd encourage you to go to the Campaign Against Climate Change website and uh, uh, either download it or get a copy. Um, I think, it, again, I did say it earlier, but the incredible amount of activity on the chat and all the links and the points that have been made really show how engaging this meeting has been for people. Uh, and we could probably talk all night if, if, we, if we had the time to do so. Uh, so I just want to say thanks to speakers and the participants for a fantastic meeting. And I'll leave it to you, Fliss, to finish off. Thanks very much to hear and Thank you, thank you for chairing. Um, very hard to finish up after all those fantastic contributions and, and speakers, and we'll certainly be saving the
the chat and the links as well to see um, what else we should be circulating from that because there's a great deal of debate. I think one area, there's so many different areas, aren't there? But there's one area that we haven't talked too much about um, is food waste, which is obviously a huge concern and a huge um, emitter of methane, but also at a time in, in food poverty and our very, very skewed system of, um, of, of, of transport and food and access and actually of nutrition as well. Um, it's quite it's uh, I was thinking about that in, in context to food poverty and I'm very pleased to say that actually um, Hackney my local borough is just becoming a right to food town um, it's a campaign that was started um, by um, in Liverpool and very much with the football team about food being a right not a charity you know sort of getting away from the idea of the food banks um, food banks are very very important but how do we really get this on the agenda, the governmental agenda, to say that we have a right to housing, you have to right to breathe fresh air and clean and drink clean water, but also a, a, a right, right to food. I think that gives us also, um, as we build that up, more scope for looking at things like um, that, that change in culture that we were talking about and, and that interesting comment from, um, I think it was from Tony about um, maybe in, in some social housing before where having you had you know communal laundries and maybe we can look more at um in some not just food growing communal food growing um and to cut the you know the, cut the carbon and the um transport to also look at our land use which is a whole nother topic you know and uh and everything that does destroy from gentrification to um to uh, to to grouse malls and golf courses um but to you know that's a whole nother subject but kind of food waste too and maybe part of that is the change in the culture and i think also we can we can see that um although we are very much um a a buy and throw away culture we have to keep turning back that responsibility to the producer we need to and discuss that that the um the consumers especially the poor consumers are not clobbered but the producer really who's making the mess in the first place always not taking responsibility is taking the brunt of that and taking the brunt of, of the change too but also in some cases as you know you know very much been brought up in a culture of wanting the latest phone trainers whatever it is also a lot of them are, are now embracing the idea uh, that Rembrandt was talking about of of recycling, of reusing clothes, of sharing clothes, of actually having, you know, I mean, maybe more of a wardrobe, but you can, you know, you can actually exchange it as well. So it's not an, an understanding that links to the very cruel um, chain of the clothing market too, and what that does globally and how workers are treated. I think we have to absolutely look at solidarity with our workers too, absolutely look at um, the people that are keeping us going, the people that they're producing, the, people, the waste workers um, who have a very, very hard task and who know that we could do things better as well. So I would say as a trade unionist, join every um, every demo, every um, every strike to support um, and, and um, let's see about how we start to create that much bigger circular economy, as we were saying, not, not small startups, but something that we build into our lives to make it easy for people. Um, and I would encourage you, as Tahir said, to um, sign up to the campaign against climate change. We've got a trade union, you, trade union group, Google group too. I don't know whether we put that in the chat, I will do. And thank you very much for coming to the meeting. And uh, we look forward to future meetings and also um, do look at the site if you want to check what's, what's gone before. Thanks a lot. Okay, cheers everybody. Thank, thanks very much. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Ask your local election candidates what they think. Thank you.